Hey there, I'm Drew. You might have seen me on TikTok, maybe Instagram. Today I'm going to talk about TIG welding, stainless steel, sanitary tubing. There's a lot of interest in this topic and there's just not a lot of good content out there. I've been doing it for about 12 years. So in this video, I'm going to explain what sanitary welding is, why it's so critical, and show you exactly how it's done. Towards the end, we'll talk money and just how much you can expect to make if you work in the industry. Let's get right into it. <laughs> oh, crap. This is a sanitary weld, also known as food grade or hygienic or high purity welding. It's not sanitary because of how clean it is on the outside, so it's on the inside that actually matters. Sanitary welding techniques are used in food processing plants, dairies, breweries, distilleries, and the pharmaceutical industry. I've probably worked in 50 or 60 different plants across 14 states for some major brands we've all heard of. So any surface, like the inside of this tubing, that comes in contact with ingredients, product, or cleaning chemicals, needs to be perfectly smooth with no cracks where bacteria can grow. The last thing one of these big companies want is a recall on their product because people are getting sick. So this is tubing. It's not pipe. Pipe is often unpolished and its thickness is classified by its schedule, like schedule 5, 10, schedule 40, or 80. It's also measured by its ID or inside diameter, whereas tubing is measured by its OD and its thickness actually changes based on the diameter size you're working with. So up through three inch are 065 wall, uh, four inch is 083 wall, and six and eight are 0.109 wall thickness. Uh, you can probably read the 304L on the side of the tubing. That's just the grade, that's the most common grade of stainless steel that I work with in sanitary tubing. Uh, 316 is another one. That's a higher grade of stainless, and that's usually used in pharmaceutical or maybe for chemical lines, stuff like that. If I butted these together and welded them with no penetration, there would be a seam on the inside where bacteria can grow. However, if I fused it with full penetration, it would oxidize immediately on the inside because there's nothing to shield the molten metal from the oxygen. That oxidation is referred to as sugar and that is why we purge sanitary tubing. We're just pushing all the oxygen out of the tubing before welding it. This is usually done with argon. Argon is an inert gas. That means it's not flammable. It just displaces the oxygen. To get the squarest cut, use an orbital saw on sanitary tubing. However, they run six to $8,000, so I don't have one. I cut this with a saw block and a sawzall. My saw block kit is from Tech South. Their tubing guides run from sizes one inch up through four inch. Uh, they also have a wing nut, a large slot for your Sawzall blade, and a small slot for your port van blade. All right, before we tack anything, I want to show you my welding rig. You'll often see something like this in the field. Uh, portability is key. You're wheeling this thing around a, a food processing plant that has lots of tight corners and is often in production. And that's why I use the Maxstar 150s and 161s. They're small, compact, and they run off of 110 power which sometimes is all you have in these food processing plants. You're not going to pull an engine drive inside and run it while they're in production. There's other welders too that are good options. I'll go over some of those here in a minute, but the Max Stars are probably the most common in the field. As you can see, I have about 12 of them. As far as my leads go, I have a 25 foot four gauge ground lead and a 25 foot 150 amp CK torch lead here with a WP17FV on it. F stands for flex head and the V stands for the valve. I just run my stinger lead to this power block over here where it meets up with the argon and the torch screws into the other side. Uh, I got quick disconnects all around on the purge hose and the torch lead. That way I can pull this whole thing out of my box and be set up in about five minutes. When you're tacking tubing, you always want a perfect fit up with no high low and no gap. And we do not add filler wire to sanitary tubing. No, it's not any weaker that way. If you have the perfect fit up, there's no loss of material your weld will be just as strong as the rest of the tubing. Also, adding wire could introduce impurities to the weld. You want short, quick tacks so you don't burn through the tubing. Watch here as I arc up, wait for the puddle to come together, drag it about an eighth inch and get out of there. If your tack is a light color, it's probably clean on the inside. However, if it's dark gray, you probably burn through. And one sugar tack can fail a whole weld. So now that I've tacked a 90 onto my piece, I can set up my purge. The purge plugs I use are from purgeplugs.com. Uh, this kit runs inch and a half through four inch. It has a back purge and a purge tree, as well as a blank and an exhaust for each size. 
Uh, they're made to withstand quite a bit of heat. However, you cannot use them on a short ferrule. It will melt. A dual flow meter like this one is going to be your best bet for running your torch and your purge at the same time on separate dials. I could probably make a full video explaining how to purge. Uh, let me know if that's something you're interested in. But here's the basics. Argon is more dense than the atmosphere we're trying to push out of the tubing. That's why you always purge in low and exhaust out a high point. It's going to fill up with argon from the bottom up. And try to beware of traps where oxygen can get caught. Now your purge pressure is set by two variables. One is your CFH from the flow meter. The other is the size of your exhaust. If you're running 12 CFH on the flow meter with a 16th inch exhaust hole, you're going to have too much purge pressure. However, if you're running 12 CFH with a quarter inch exhaust hole, you won't have enough purge pressure. So you just want to play around with it and experiment until you get a nice flush weld that's not caved in or pushed out. It's also a good idea to seal off all your weld seams. This is so argon does not leak out, but also oxygen does not leak in. I like to use electrical tape for this. I do put it on backwards so it does not leave a sticky residue. It's also easy to remove and still seals the weld. We are finally ready to weld. I let this small piece purge for a couple minutes. You'll learn from experience how long you need to let any given piece purge based on its length and diameter. To purge longer lines, it's a good idea to use a meter like this one from Forensic Detectors. It has a probe and tells me my O2 levels inside the tubing. This device also doubles as my sniffer when I do tank entry. I cleaned the color off my tacks with a stainless wire brush and buffed any other dirt off the weld seam. On pharmaceutical jobs, you may even clean the seam with alcohol to remove fingerprints. You generally want to weld from bottom to top, brush the color off your start and stop, then switch to the other side and go bottom to top again. The less starts and stops, the better, and make sure you overlap them about an inch. The side of the weld that you end on is the direction it's going to pull. So flip your piece back and forth as you move from weld to weld so that it pulls evenly. Notice how the tip of my tungsten stays directly over the weld seam. It's not a wide weave from left to right. The cup is just rotating around that point. This is how you get the most penetration out of any given amperage. If you look closely, you can see a small whirlwind whipping around in the tip of my puddle. This is a sign you're getting good penetration. Watch here as I arc up, sit still for a few seconds, wait for that swirling to start, and then I take off walking. Nearly everyone in the field walks the cup. Despite a few angry people that don't know how to telling you otherwise, it is the easiest way to get the most consistent bead. With that being said, you do need to learn how to freehand well also, because sometimes you get into a jam and there's just not enough room to walk the cup. Here you can see just how much I overlap my starts and stops to avoid thin spots and skippers on the inside. You can also see that the weld is a nice shade of gold, and that's what you're looking for. The edges are a little dark on this one. Darkness on the inside of a weld can happen for several reasons not letting it purge long enough or not having a good seal on your purge. Also, welding too cold can cause problems. It takes that much longer to get good penetration and by the time you get to the end of your weld, you've cooked it. Welding too hot and not having enough gas coverage could also be reasons the inside of your weld is too dark. Most of the time you'll be running lift arc, so you need to know how to properly terminate your weld. If you pull your torch away from the puddle suddenly, it's going to oxidize, leaving a crater and a pinhole. That's why we feather it out gradually. It's called a tail off. You're going to move faster and faster, pulling your tungsten away from the tubing. As your puddle gets smaller and eventually disappears, that's when it's okay to rip your torch off. This is no tail off, and this is a good tail off. So there you have it, the finished weld. Flush on the outside, smooth and colorless on the inside. Uh, depending on the customer or what product is running through the pipes, it may or may not get passivated. As the welder, you need to at least clean the color off the outside of the tubing. I usually buff the color off with a 3M radial bristle brush, then blend it in with a piece of Scotch-Brite. Uh, technically, you should clean the outside with nitric acid. This restores the stainless properties removed by the heat and prevents future rusting on the heat-affected zone. Some contractors don't bother with this, but Wonder Gel is the product that I use. As far as welders go, the Star 150s were hands down the best welder you're going to buy for sanitary welding. They have since been replaced with the 161s. They are not quite as reliable as the 150s, but still your best bet if you're doing this full time. However, if you don't want to spend $1,800, check out Everlast's line of welders. They have plenty of features. They weld real nice. They're just going to cost about a quarter of the price. And lastly, if you're just starting out, if you're a hobbyist, if you're on a budget and you're not sure if you're going to stick with it, Try out the Yes Welder TIG 205DS. 
It's a very basic, simple machine with no features like pulse, high freak, or uh, lift arc. However, you can still scratch start and weld sanitary just fine with it. So if you're on a budget, that might be the route you want to go. Now, I also happen to have a discount code for the Yes Welder. Use the link in my description and the discount code for 10% off the already affordable Yes Welder machine. So let's talk money. There's a pretty wide range of incomes within the welding industry, and there's even a wide range of incomes within the sanitary welding industry. If you want to work a shop job and be home every night, you can probably expect to make 50, 60,000 a year. If you want to sacrifice your social life, be out in the field all the time, working on the road, you can make anywhere from 70 to 100,000 a year, sometimes more. But you will be working 70, 80 hours a week, almost every week. If you're interested in pipe fitting, that's a good way to add a couple bucks an hour to your income. Also, if you get tired of being an employee and you have the opportunity, you can become a subcontractor and make even more money. However, companies will bring you on for one specific job, and as soon as it's over, they'll cut you loose and you'll be looking for work again. I hope you found this video helpful. If you'd be interested in a dedicated purging video, or a how to walk the cup tutorial, or a tour of the tool set that I take with me on the road, let me know in the comments which one you'd prefer. If you're not interested at all, be sure to not hit the subscribe button. That is the best way to let me know you don't want any more information on this topic. If you have other questions, leave them in the comments or DM me on my social medias. I try to respond to everyone. Till next time, I'm Drew Matthew, and I'm Welding America. <laughs> that sounded even dumber out loud.